Well, good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for coming. And you're so intrepid to come out in this weather. Thank you so much for being here. This is such a special evening, and we are so honored to have the work of Ula here. So without further ado, we'll start our interview with Ula Wolfs. Rather than do a lengthy interview, I'm going to just ask Ula really to talk to you about, you know, her educational background, which I think you're going to find really interesting in her journey to becoming an artist. Thank you very much. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I'm very happy to be here. Two passions have already been laid in my life. I think one for literature and the other for visual arts. And it all came to daylight life when I was about three years old, listening to the fairy tales connected by the Green Brothers. And I was told these fairy tales and deeply sunk into this fantastic world. And to stay longer in this world, I began to paint and draw what I had heard. And I actively also out, for example, a carpet in my room became a flying carpet and I could fly into the fantastic worlds. Later, I was very interested in the church, which was clear. At school, was German was my uh, favorite subject because I uh, could learn everything about literature and about the human being seen from the perspective of literature. And after my final exam and the German gymnasium, I wanted to become either an actress or a stage director. <laughs> and but my parents were not so happy to hear that because at that time they thought it was not so decent for a girl <laughs> to learn these professions. I think they anticipated the me too. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Philology. I studied journalistics and linguistics for six years at six different universities because I knew when I was uh, a when I was uh, married and was a teacher I couldn't see the, all these towns and so I began with Munich and then went to Tübingen, to Berlin, to Cologne, to Münster and to Würzburg. <coughs> After my six years of studies, I practiced for three years at a big uh, German gymnasium and soon became one of the seven headmasters at that uh, school. I was responsible for the departments of language and art and to organize that. And I was a teacher for German, English, and drama. And it was a great pleasure for me to introduce my pupil mm, to literature, both analytically and practically. Okay, and our, our members always want to know if artists have formal or if they're training or if they're self-taught and when did they start their art and um, kind of their artistic journey. Yes, I am a self-taught painter, um, but I think my uh, profession as a teacher for drama helped me a lot as far as composition is concerned. And uh, some art critics are of the opinion that uh, my paintings show my work with pupils on the stage. And um, I studied the history of art myself and developed my faculties of painting. I never stopped painting and studied uh, techniques by books and um, by trial and error. And it would have uh, spared me time if I had studied <laughs> um, fine arts at, uh, at an academy. But um, at that time, after my I was not sure if I could make um, 
a lady of the becoming a great man, a bit afraid. I knew that I could have become a good stage director. That was clear, but and so, but uh, I never stopped uh, painting, and, and I uh, learned a lot, as I already said, by uh, putting um, drama plays on the stage with my pupils to fill the stage with uh, to to uh, arrange the entrances and the exits. All that uh, helped me um, also for composing. So clearly you're a surrealist and you and I have talked about uh, the influence that the surrealists have on you and, and your admiration for their work, but I think the audience will be surprised that your love of poetry and how poetry informs your work. So will you talk about your artistic influences, both the surrealists and the poetry that you love? Yes, uh, there are many influences. I was influenced by both by poets, the great poets, and by the great visual artists, but not only by that. I also was very interested in ethnology books and uh, my serious spirit of the rainforest. Uh, and I also was very interested in psychology. I read a lot about the subconscious and uh, also was fascinated by books by self attempts by uh, the dolphin, the American dolphin explorer, um, John Lee, who also explored his own consciousness by living for some days in a, in a water tank and he put all down what had to do with people's consciousness. It was also very and lastly, also the philosophers, uh, the pre Socratics. I was very fond of them because, um, in a way, their worldview resembles that of North American Shaman. In, in short, um, they were able to meet uh, ghosts and spirits and gods in the middle of the day, in any place, at any time. So, um, to be more concrete, I was fascinated by the visual painters, by the symbolist Edward Munch, and especially by the Saudians, by Max Ernst, Orkley, Dali, Margaret. I love all these painters and what they wrote about, also their, their, what they said in books about painting. And uh, I was also influenced very much by poets, poets and dramatists. Uh, for example, by the wonderful poems by the Austrian, uh, Austrian poet Ingeborg Bachmann, also by Paul Celan, by Forilke, um, and by Gottfried Ben. But also, I was fascinated by the dramatist of the absurd by Beckett and UNESCO and I admire that they found means and ways to present um, the reduction of modern man um, estranged from his fellow persons, his fellow men, estranged from their own self, estranged from nature. I admired Beckett and UNESCO very much, and put also the rhinoceros by Eugene UNESCO on the stage with my pupil. And I was fascinated how they could represent the rhinoceros. <laughs> <laughs> So, uh, with surrealism, you know, we have discussions about the emotional impact because it's not obviously representational art. It's going to create an emotional reaction in the viewer. So, what emotional connection do you think viewers would have with your work, or do you hope that they have with your work from an emotional connection? 
Yes, I think that it's the themes they are interested in. In short, I have as a main, as my main theme for the double, double perspective, I will speak about it later. I want to show us human beings in an in infinite reality. I think our re reality is infinite. It belongs of everything we can perceive by our senses, it, by everything we have experienced in life, but it also consists of dreams, of thoughts. Uh, this is why reality for me is infinite. I live in both worlds equally, in the visible and in the invisible world. And I want to show us human beings in this infinite reality. I want to show our many processes, our sorrows, our happiness, our dreams, our effectiveness. And I'm very much interested in our relationship to our fellow men, to ourselves, to God, to the Newman, to the universe. To show this in my painting. And I think there is a connection to the viewer because these are themes which would belong to us. Perhaps I can, I could add, um, I'm interested in the basic themes, um, in life, love, and death, and all the themes um, which, which can be subsumed uh, in this. But I sometimes also um, um, put uh, on the canvas uh, social things, social themes, not very often, but uh, I remember in the last uh, two years I painted, I painted two, um, no, four, four paintings with uh, more or less social themes. Um, one is called Barriers. Naturally, the main trigger was where the fugitives, but uh, barriers are also, and there are more than such barriers. There are also other barriers between. And another painting was called Beware When the Shadow Takes the Lead. And, uh, I think I have that one here. Is this in this book? It's contained here. Um, the two men who are running. Um, I was influenced by what. Here we go. This is the shadow. Is. Say the name again. Say the name yes, again. It is uh, Beware When the Shadow Takes the Lead. Here are presented, he has presented only one man, but uh, with his shadow. And the shadow takes the lead. And I painted the third hand, I think it's the female hand, holding back, uh, trying to hold back um, this man with the last hand, that he, that he is not led by his shadow. And uh, the trigger was that I felt we are surrounded by many political leaders who are in danger that their shadows take the lead. Another painting um, had to do with abuse, with, with children abused by the church, is also very terrible for me. And I call this painting The Cross of Abuse. It's not in this book, yeah. So, um, but as I already said, I'm more interested in the basics. So we were talking about surrealism, and what do you think surrealism specifically contributes to art and life? I think this is a very interesting question. And to answer very short, in a very short way, I would say surrealism is a stronghold against superficiality. 
I want to quote a statement by Salvador Dali. He says, um, Salarianism is not a movement, it is a latent state of mind perceivable by the powers of dream and nightmare. As to this, I myself am a Salarianist in this way because uh, I very much live in the invisible world of this world. Um, but I think for most of the viewers, they are all, I know they are always interested in Sarajevo. Many, many people are interested in Sarajevo. It's interesting for them to, um, to get into contact with the fantastic, with the unexpected. And um, perhaps they are also reminded by painting by the Sarajevo. Hmm. They are reminded of the fact that we all belong to both worlds, to the visible and the invisible world. Over there, I painted um, that there's a painting um, which I call Sorry of Beauty. And um, I painted um, the front. With the sewing machine, one there with the sewing machine, yeah, okay. Painting on that wall, and of course, I have beauty. And um, they're standing Lotte Amon, um, sorry, a poet who wrote Le Chant de Marot, a French poet. And um, I was always fascinated by his definition of sorry for sorry of beauty. He said, and that's what I told my most of my pupils when I introduced introduce them to uh, the, the epoch of uh, Sorianism and of Dadaism, I always thought of it. Um, it's uh, read, the quote reads, um, the beauty of Sorianism is a fortuitous meeting of a sewing machine and an umbrella on a dissection table. <laughs> Which leads to the fact that the Sorians uh, arranged their elements in their, in their paintings uh, not in the normal rational way, but in an irrational way, which opens the eyes of the viewer so that the viewer looks and you at reality at this presented in these paintings, they look at you as things because of this uh, strange arrangement of scenes. And they look at these paintings with the curious and unbiased eyes of a child, and I think that's also attractive. And the unexpected and seeing things in you with new eyes. So a strong I, as I put it, it is, uh, I think Sarajevo really is a, a stronghold against the superficiality of today. Uh, I once uh, paint, uh, I, I uh, made a painting with the title The Dominance of uh, the Surface, which has the same, which is the same theme. So a question for the audience. How many of you have had a surrealistic dream? I mean, aren't dreams always surrealistic? Like, you know, I've got bears talking to me and, you know, I'm flying and this and that. So that surrealism is in our dreams. And you and I had a great conversation the other day about dreams. And I asked you if you've ever had a dream that you've been painted. So I think they'd like to hear that. Yes, um, I have often put down interesting dreams. Once I painted directly what I had seen in this in a, in, in a dream. It's mystery, which uh, can it's mystery which we're seeing in this painting, um, but it reveals a lot about uh, about the dream of about myself. Can you talk about the painting that I think your son and daughter-in-law are standing by? The half 
submerged half with the Shakespeare quotes. I yes, love that. I yeah. integrated the, the Shakespeare quote <laughs> in this uh, painting. It's called, the painting is called Diving Within. And I was very happy that I could integrate this famous quote by Shakespeare, which I love very much and which um, shows my view of life. It says, we are such stuff as dreams are made of, and our little life is rounded with a sleep. That I want to show here, um, the head is only partly about his reality, and, um, and the realm underneath the surface is much greater, much bigger, greater than the uh, world on the surface. It's like the peak of an iceberg and the subconscious is below a great realm which one can perhaps explore. So from a technical standpoint, you have a really a very color palette. Um, all different types of colors and very vibrant and uh, can you talk a little bit about why you have even the one over there I love the fan that's got you know all the different shades you know gradation could you talk a little bit about your color palette yes about my color palette and, and also in the same connection about my style I want to say a bit about that one style and colors have always played the supporting role the serve serving role um, in the foreground of my themes and I try to find the adequate colors and the adequate style for um, conveying a special theme. So I choose always new. For me the best way of presenting my theme and I choose my colors only because I want to uh, show the theme as good as possible. Because to my style, I make use of an archive of uh, dreams and uh, of dream projections. And uh, I also like to employ um, private symbols or also abstract elements to convey a special message. So we've all been seeing around the world uh, a resurgence of women artists and Museum of Modern Art, as you and I discussed the other day, is reopening with women artists as the focus. So could you talk a little bit? I know in Europe there are a lot of museums that are featuring women artists right now, so it seems to be the zeitgeist of the moment to, to feature women artists. Can you talk a little bit about... You and I had a really interesting conversation about women in art and uh, what kind of message you want to send about that. Yeah. Hmm. This is the long run of pat patriarchy. We females uh, and our uh, creativity uh, was uh, subdued because the female painters wanted to sit on their thrones alone, I think. And uh, now there are many exhibitions presenting only female artists. But I don't like this. I don't think it's the right way to, to support women's art or women in art. I never uh, took part in, uh, in an exhibition of just female artists. Because I think art has no gender. I don't think my paintings are especially female. Okay. So uh, I will do one more question and we'll open it up to see if the audience has any questions for you. So, you know, how would you sum up the message of, the, of your art? What message would you like to send with your art? Yes, let me do that in a very short way. Um, I want to say it with a quote by André Breton, one of the leading heads of surrealism. He says, what is admirable about the fantastic 
is that there is no longer any fantastic. It's all real. They won't hear you in the back. Uh, yeah, you mentioned uh, the Renaissance play by uh, Ian Espinel. I was fortunate enough to see that play at the French Embassy a few years ago, uh, which uh, I thought was, was fantastic. So you're coming from a background of drama, and I'm presently reading uh, Anthony Artaud's Theatre and its Double um, about uh, the role of the shadow in, um, in theatre. Um, and I think that's it's, it's really remarkable that you're coming from this 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 uh, is Saint Constantin uh, uh, in, into into another into another another uh, another discipline. Um, but I am fond of the work of Giorgio Di uh, Yes. And okay. I, I hope you'll be able to oh, yes. say something. Jordan Kirito, I love his first work. And he changed his uh, style, you know, but I love his work very much. So it's metaphysical. Uh, mm -hmm. The Scuola Metaphysica was the. Pardon? The Scuola Metaphysica was the Metaphysical School. Metaphysical School, yes. I'm, I feel very keen for this school. Any other questions? David? Okay, let me get to the mic. Hi, I'm um, sitting in this room. We're surrounded by faces. This room. And uh, you're drawn to painting faces that stare right at us. And I'm wondering whose faces they might be, whose faces inspire you, or are they all you? <laughs> Great question. Leave it to the pro to ask the best question. I really don't know. Um, I don't think so. I don't think uh, it's all me. <laughs> um, I invent these faces. I invent them for painting. But sometimes uh, I also use uh, photographs here for, to, to, uh, for this painting, for example. I chose photos of my friends, Paul Edouard, Salvador Dali, André Breton, and Ben Brady, to whom Roche Yaman explains or defines his, uh, his uh, definition of Rosario beauty. But uh, I don't think uh, that's all me in the painting. You know. uh, my feet, yes, but not me. in my mind, and I uh, draw 
sketches and uh, draw the elements of this um, concept in my mind. And I turn them around and I uh, uh, arrange them in you. And then uh, I paint this. It's, it's, they are, they are, there is really a, a special concept behind it. I want to, to show a special thing. But uh, there's also a totally different way of uh, creating uh, painting. Uh, for example, I use very thin acrylic paint, paints, paint, and uh, I let them run um, over the canvas. In this way, and uh, in this way, and then a special pattern uh, comes and um, turns out, and I put it on the easel, and I turn this round and round, and I think of what might that be, and mo very often, more than one scene um, begin to develop, and I try to um, create, or to, to work it out, and to uh, make a, a painting of it. And if you like the image take over, do you let the image take over in this development, this process? Does the image take over? Does the image the take over? Art, yes, very often. That's a, that's a new, that's a very new one. Um, what I found out new, but because I uh, don't have uh, the time to work on a painting, um, hour after hour and then it's complete. I let it sometimes because there is no time and then um, the painting really takes over and uh, it leads me to things which I haven't, haven't planned and uh, that's most interesting. I, it often happens yes. and I uh, then I have an idea and I, then I go to the, to the computer and find out something about where this all flows into the painting and uh, finally I, I'm looking for a title. <laughs> That's the most interesting way to start the painting. Any other questions? Yeah. Since you mentioned uh, Carlos Castaneda and John Lilly, and you mentioned the shamans and things like that, I'm just wondering if you yourself had any personal experience with chemicals that uh, have helped you uh, uh, see things. Personal experience with drugs. With, with drugs, chemicals, drugs? With, uh, no. You don't have to answer that question. <laughs> I'm okay, okay. I'm very interested to read about that. I never tried it because I'm very afraid of becoming dependent on drugs and I never tried it. Um, but I'm very interested uh, to read about that and I also read about Elvis Huxley, the, um, the, the laws of perception in which he, uh, in this book he speaks of his, uh, of what he sees uh, at the, the effect of drugs. Very interesting for me. I myself once had an experience uh, when my boy produced some thing, some sort of drugs because I, I couldn't, I couldn't sleep for three weeks and that brought about this effect which resembles that I spoke with persons who know of taking drugs and uh, what I saw in this, in this situation resembles a lot that of people who take drugs. But that was a drug was created within me. I was very interested how, how uh, this came. And I read about it, and they, as they say, there is a special, I don't know the English names to do it. Plant. Say that out. Plant. Yeah. Um, there, there is a special. Plant. Plant, yeah. Um, which uh, produces uh, this sort of stuff. And it was fascinating for 
for me, uh, but also what I saw in this uh, situation. So we are going to ask some questions one way or another. You mentioned that um, you were thinking about the last curtain, for example. About what? The last curtain or death. Last curtain. Right. Um, and you talk about um, your paintings are reflective of uh, life and love and death. Uh, I was wondering how, if, if you think that painting is cathartic for you in terms of thinking about death now that you are in your third act, as they say, right? Um, how, how, does, how do you feel about death? Do you, do you have a resolution after you paint? Do you, does, do you feel that by painting that you have resolved uh, what you were looking for? Yeah, let me uh, uh, okay. She's just asking if uh, when you finish a painting, how do you know that you've achieved what you had said? Are you always satisfied that the painting has conveyed what you want? Does it answer the initial question? Does it answer the question that had started the painting? Oh, what? <laughs> I, don't know. I don't know if we're going to get there. <laughs> Catharsis, yeah. Can you tell her in German what catharsis? Oh, oh she does. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Catharsis? What do you mean by a form of catharsis? Take me into 
into a very slow level, the business. And I very often take readings and take reading and then in the both world I'm very much in the invisible world. No no special thing. We've got a question over here. Yes. She wants to know if you've ever done a series, if you finished one painting and you felt you needed to do another painting to continue the story. Oh, um, yes, that happens. <laughs> I can show you. Um, I hope I answered your question. I understood it. Um, and this painting, this painting is called Metamorphosis. And it uh, goes back to my fascination of a special fairy tale. It's called Jorinde and Joringa, also connected by the Grimm brothers. And in this uh, painting, um, two lovers uh, come too close to a castle in which uh, an ugly and uh, evil witch lives. And it is forbidden to get very close to that castle. But they didn't pay attention and came very close to the castle. And then the witch came as a bird and uh, she morphed um, only, she morphed only the, in the fairy tale, the young woman into a bird, and uh, the young man stood still at a stone, and after she had disappeared, mm. the witch had disappeared, um, she went through the land alone and wanted to have back his uh, girlfriend, Jorinde, and um, until finally he found a special plant with which he could, uh, with which he went back to the castle and he uh, freed all the girls who were uh, kept in cages by this ugly bitch and uh, that was the end of the, of the fairy tale. I, uh, I changed uh, this fairy tale. This, this has, I come to your question a bit later. Um, um, this is not a real illustration of the painting because uh, both uh, both men and women, the young man and the young woman, are changed into birds and they are put into different cages. And, and then now I come to, to your question. Um, I ask myself. How can I help these birds to get out of the cave? And I painted um, sequin, uh, uh, see, uh, another painting. And in that painting, it, is, it was called The Overthrow of the Magician. And uh, so they found, uh, two persons found a way uh, to get out of their cages find a way to each other. Mm -hmm. uh, yes, it, it was a thought that soon was Well, I want to give a couple shout outs first to our curatorial assistant, Bailey Gummini. Bailey, stand up, who hung this show. And, uh, Lula has exhibited many, many prestigious institutions, and she said that Bailey was phenomenal and so nice to work with. So we're very proud of her and that she hung the show so beautifully. And Karen, our board member Karen Niesman, who brought the show to us, would you tell um, everybody kind of how you came to know Lula and how the show came to us? Uh, hi. So I am my neighbor here, Anivia. Uh, it's friends with the daughter-in-law, Marina, 
Marina uh, and her husband live in Seminole Heights in Tampa. And uh, so Amelia talked to me about, I love the arts and I'm involved in the arts and things where she said, we would really like to bring a show. And I said, please let us have it here. And I spoke with Diana and we were able to bring it. So we are very happy to have you here. It's so, it's so wonderful for us. And I hope that you stay in some way and that your art stays in Tampa and you continue to come and visit us and we can continue to see your work. Thank you. I want, I want to thank all of you for very much. You for inviting me to come here to this wonderful room uh, for thinkers, for artists, thinkers, innovators, and dreamers. I feel so well here, and I'm so very happy about uh, the work of your cur curatorial assistant, Daily, um, um, who gives a hanging in a wonderful, sensitive way. And I'm so happy to be here in this uh, in this city, uh, St. Petersburg, with a great dining museum where I spent many hours. <laughs> when my daughter-in-law said to me, "Why don't you come?" I, I wanted to go to New York to find the gallery there. When we uh, were last year, I, I had an exhibition in Rome, so the exhibition and they asked me, "What will be your your next?" Uh, Project. I said I, I tried to find a gallery in New York because I only had the uh, four group exhibitions there. And then um, Marina, you said, why don't you um, show your paintings? There is a very interesting uh, place in, uh, in St. Petersburg, um, the Art Exchange. And I said, yes, I would like to come. It's a good home. In Petersburg, because I have already show, shown my work, I already showed my works in a solar exhibition in Russia in St. Petersburg. <laughs> She's being very modest, only at the Hermitage. Being very, very <laughs> modest. So I've said all week we're not worthy, you know, to have her here, but we're so honored that you let us have your work and, and show our community your beautiful work, and it's been an absolute honor and a privilege. Thank you so much.